Uh, hi, this is Jonathan Pollack at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, to introduce Dr. Jason Stein, who is assistant professor in the Department of Genetics and Neuroscience Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Stein uh, received his Bachelor's of Arts at Northwestern University and received his Doctor of Philosophy at UCLA. Uh, did his thesis work with Dr. Paul Thompson, and then did postdoctoral work with um, uh, Dan Geshwin at UCLA. And he will now talk about evaluating the overlap between common genetic variants influencing brain structure and neuropsychiatric disease. So, without further ado, I give you Dr. Jason Stein. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks Jonathan for the invitation and uh, thank you all for joining in on this webinar. Talk to you, like Jonathan said, about evaluating the overlap between common genetic variants influencing brain structure and influencing neuropsychiatric diseases. So the general goals in psychiatric genetics. The first is to find genetic variants influencing risk for developing diseases uh, like schizophrenia. Um, here, in order to do this, what you need to do is gather large groups of controls and patients with a certain disease, in this case schizophrenia, and you also need to genotype them. And in certain places in the genome, there are variable genotypes. Um, if they're a single nucleotide, we call them single nucleotide polymorphisms. And what we try to see is where variants are uh, overrepresented in controls versus cases. So here you can see the A allele is overrepresented in controls versus cases. When we do this in large enough sample sizes, we can say that the allele, uh, in this case the opposite allele, is associated with schizophrenia. So in this case, we have found a new genetic variant influencing risk for schizophrenia. The goal is to find uh, a mechanism by which these single nucleotide polymorphisms or any genetic variant influences risk for a very complicated disease. So there must be some biological pathway by which genetic variation uh, goes through to create risk for a very highly complicated behavioral disease such as schizophrenia. Two general goals. Uh, in order to achieve those goals, we can use a concept that's called the endophenotype. So the idea here is that we measure some phenotype, uh, whatever it is, in this case brain structure, that uh, we find how genetic variation influences the endophenotype and we think that this will help us better understand how genetic variation influences disease risk. So the type has uh, a classic definition. Um, so it has multiple parts associated with it. First is that it is associated with the illness in the population. So in the case of brain structure, you would say uh, there's altered brain structure. Um, this particular phenotype uh, in, the, um, in patients with the disease. Second, that it's heritable. There is a genetic influence on the endophenotype. It's primarily state-independent, so it manifests in an individual whether or not the illness is active. Um, and then also within families, the endophenotype and the illnesses co-segregates, and it's found in unaffected family members at a higher rate than in the general population. So um, these criteria define the endophenotype classically but usually a common addition, and that addition is that less complex, there's a less complex genetic architecture for the phenotype than there is for the disorder. So the idea being that the link between genetic uh, risk factors and the endophenotype is stronger than genetic risk factors and the disease. Okay, so bother to study endophenotypes, how will they help us? Well, uh, this gets back to the two central questions in psychiatric genetics. So uh, first is to understand the mechanism of disease-associated variants. So a variant does not directly cause a psychiatric illness. Rather, it must be mediated via some biological process, and that biological process is generally unknown. So phenotype may help us understand this biological process better by putting something middle here. Phenotype also allows us to characterize known disease variants. So if we know the disease variant, the variant associated with disease, um, if we know how it influences the endophenotype, we can better understand uh, that variant. Um, it's also a way to localize the effect or develop mechanisms of known disease-associated genetic variants. 
So say, for example, all of my uh, schizophrenia risk alleles seem to have a function on hippocampal volume, then uh, that would be good reason to study uh, cells in the hippocampus for their association to schizophrenia. So that's one reason is mechanism of disease-associated variants. Another that's uh, also talked about is higher power genetic search. So if genes have a stronger influence on an endophenotype than on disease itself, endophenotype genetics may be better powered to detect effects than disease genetics. So it would be that if we can create this link stronger, we may learn something about the disease. Imaging genetics, which is the field that I'm going to talk about here, um, this is what people generally think of, um, I believe, when they think about an endophenotype in imaging genetics. Okay, so some causal models for an endophenotype. So there's an assumption when people are doing endophenotype work uh, that they're using the mediational model. So the idea with the mediational model is that the genes influence, the genetic variants influence both the endophenotype and risk for disease. So the gene uh, the endophenotype mediates the risk between genes and disease. Okay, there, uh, this model has a lot of assumptions with it. Uh, there's also a model with less assumptions where the genetic variants influence both the endophenotype and disease. However, there's no causal link between the endophenotype and the disease. Think of a silly example to give uh, for this. So let's think that uh, uh, the more sunny days there are, the more I get sunburns, say that's my endophenotype, and the more sunny days there are, the more plants grow, the quicker plants grow. However, there's no causal link between the two of these. Example of this pleiotropy or liability index model. A mediational model you can think of, the more sunny days there are, the more I get sunburned, the more my skin peels. So there is a causal relationship there. That's the example, but um, it is important that these two different models tell us different things about whatever endophenotype we're, we're interested in. And both of these models actually satisfy the criteria of the endophenotype as previously described. So learn from each of the different models. Well, the mediational model can actually help us uh, understand mechanistic study and allows us to perform higher power genetic search, where the liability index model only allows the higher um, high power genetic search, but does not really a mechanistic study because the endophenotype may not be mechanistically related to disease. So these models um, allow different assumption or allow different study of uh, different aspects of the endophenotype. Um, we've actually made an assumption, and that assumption is that the same genetic variants influence both the endophenotype and disease. Um, however, a more realistic model model is where one where some genetic variants influence only the endophenotype, so those are found here, and influence only disease risk, those are found here, and some overlap as defined by this genetic correlation, RG. So if RG is high, the endophenotype genetics is informative about disease genetics, and we get actually, we go back to this, if RG equals 1. If RG is low, then the endophenotype genetics tell us little about disease genetics. And then there's independent genetic influences. So some genetics influence the endophenotype, some genetics influence disease. There's very little relation between the two. Okay, I talked a little bit about genetic correlation. I'd like to talk about the way I conceptualize an endophenotype. Uh, what is a good endophenotype? So imagine you have two axes. One is genetic correlation with disease, the other is effect size, <clears throat> and you have different traits. Each can have a different genetic correlation with disease and also have different effect sizes usually found for that trait. Imagine you have disease itself, it's perfectly genetically correlated with the disease because it is the disease. How effect sizes are in general very, very low. Um, so it's a large number of samples to find those effects. You can also have other um, trait you can study. For example, DNA's hypersensitivity QTLs or expression QTLs. These have uh, individually at least likely low genetic correlation with disease. Uh, they also have high effect size. So traits that sort of have been studied. What we are really interested in is the optimal inter intermediate phenotype or endophenotype, excuse me, which has high genetic correlation with disease and high effect size. So this would be the ideal. It would allow us to perform genetic search uh, with higher power, 
and to have very high relationship with the disease. Now we've defined the endophenotype, so now we want to go through uh, each of the criteria of the endophenotype as best we can, and see if brain structure, uh, what we're interested in studying, satisfies the criteria of being an endophenotype for schizophrenia. Okay, so um, is the, one of the first criteria is the heritability of these subcortical brain structures. So heritability tells how much of the uh, phenotypic variance is explained by genetic variance, usually done in twin studies. And here is a meta-analysis of multiple twin studies, which is a great paper found here. Um, so uh, the variance in the phenotype can be divided into three components, the additive genetic component, A, which is often referred to as the heritability, environment and unique environment slash experimental error. So the idea here is that these uh, components, the red components here, are all pretty high, um, and that they're all significantly different from zero, meaning that uh, all of these brain structures have a high degree of heritability, uh, meaning that there are genetic factors influencing their variation in the population. So in general, heritability is high for all well-measured brain structures. The smaller the structures you get are, the less well-measured they are, uh, the more the heritability decreases. The endophenotype is that it should be different in cases versus controls. So this is a large study called the Enigma Schizophrenia Study. It's uh, cases are compared to controls uh, for different volumetric measures of brain structures. So you see 2,000, we've uh, done a meta-analysis, so it's uh, 2,000 schizophrenia patients and 2,500 healthy controls. You can see that certain structures are decreased in schizophrenia relative to control. So hippocampus, uh, amygdala, thalamus, and accumbens are decreased. And left ventricle is increased in patients versus controls. And there are some structures, whoops, there are some structures that, um, that don't have significant differences at the, um, at the end we have here. So um, are brain structure differences found in family mem unaffected family members with schizophrenia? So here we have a meta-analysis of multiple studies. Um, we're all getting a, about 1,000 a subjects who are first-degree relatives of patients with schizophrenia. And they do find that hippocampal volume in unaffected first-degree relatives is decreased as compared to uh, healthy controls. So this implies that there's some uh, genetic or environmental component. Um, one is that we can try to assess this genetic correlation that I talked about before is to get large sample sizes, uh, genome-wide association studies. So I want those genome-wide association studies to find SNPs affecting brain structure and SNPs affecting risk for schizophrenia. So the first is uh, this link, uh, finding SNPs affecting uh, risk for schizophrenia. This has been done through a schizophrenia genome-wide association study that was published in Nature in 2014. Um, this is a really incredible study uh, for the field of psychiatric genetics. It got together 37,000 cases with schizophrenia, 113,000 controls, and doing uh, the, a genome-wide association analysis, 108 uh, loci were significantly associated with risk for schizophrenia. Yeah. This is a huge boon to the field of psychiatric genetics because for the first time we have um, many, many genetic variants which we can really hang our hat on and say that these are strongly associated with risk for developing the disease. We one aspect of this, we have the schizophrenia GWAS. What we need is the second aspect, so how do SNPs affect brain structure? And so Medlin, I think, talked to you about this last week uh, a little bit, but for those who weren't there, um, I'll briefly go over um, the Enigma Consortium and what we found. So homogenetic variation has only a small effect on brain structure, um, as I showed last week. So and also in a genome-wide association, many statistical tests are conducted. Therefore, our calculations tell us that huge sample sizes on the order of greater than 10,000 subjects are needed in order to find and replicate association of individual genetic variants. For, as both imaging and genotyping are expensive, we really need a consortium to pool enough subjects to get significant power, or to get power to find significant results. Seeing this need, we formed the consortium called the Enigma Consortium. It's the Enhancing Neuroimaging Genetics Through Meta-Analysis Consortium. Um, it was founded in 2009 with just three institutions. Um, it's really blossomed and expanded 
We have over 185 institutions participating in the consortium with over 300 authors on our publications, resulting in around 30,000 subjects contributing to the analysis. Um, so now we can uh, start getting sufficient power to ask the questions that we're interested in. And into multiple multinational meta-analytic projects, including genetics of brain structure, which I'll talk to you about here, genetics of brain function, and analytic effects on disease, which I referred to briefly, but um, are a lot of projects actually associated with those. Okay, here's uh, Enigma. It's truly a worldwide collaborative initiative to find replicable genetic influences on brain structure. Uh, you can see each of these individual little men is where uh, we have a cohort contributing both imaging data and genetic data. So uh, those are found around the world, and we also have uh, the different working groups for the disease uh, meta-analysis type of type of analyses. Uh, over 185 institutions and over 300 co-authors contributing to these type of analysis allow us again to gain sufficient power to do the analyses we're interested in. So how it work? Um, first, each individual site collects um, T1 weighted structural MRI images of the brain. Um, we then provide protocols for doing uh, imaging segmentation um, and calculating volumetric measures of uh, these different uh, image seg sent images. So those are the types we're interested in. We provide genetics protocols. Uh, genotyping is, us is done uh, using commercially available platforms. We then impute 2,000 genomes. And uh, the genome-wide association is conducted at the, at the level of the individual site. So importantly, all raw data, uh, both imaging and genotypes, are only held at the individual site. The individual site conducts the um, genome-wide association study. Um, then after that, um, the results are metalized at a central site. So the summary statistics are uploaded to a central site, and we can conduct the meta-analysis. When we uh, do these type of genome-wide association studies, what we get are something called a Manhattan plot, which you can see uh, here. So these Manhattan plots show on the x-axis the different chromosomes and walking along each of the different chromosomes that represent individual SNPs, single-nucleotide polymorphisms, and the y-axis represents their significance for the phenotype we're interested in. Importantly, uh, because we conduct so many associations, um, the strict uh, genome-wide significance level above which we declare variants uh, genome-wide significant. Here there are a few variants, a few loci in the genome that survive genome significance for their association to putamen volume. So that Enigma works. So what has Enigma found? So first, uh, the first project of the Enigma consortium was a pilot project focusing on hippocampal and cranial volume genome-wide association. So here you can see the hippocampus uh, segmented in red. Um, in this study, uh, we had 20,000 subjects in discrete and replication. About, I, I think it was about 7,000 subjects in just the discovery sample. Type of analysis, we found one uh, interesting hit that was uh, in chromosome 12. This hit actually did not survive genome-wide significance um, in our initial discovery sample, but after replication with another consortium, we got 21,000 subjects and a very strongly significant p-value of 6 times 10 to the negative 16th, which survives our genome-wide significance criteria. So we identified a novel uh, genome-wide significant locus affecting hippocampal volume. So importantly, this genetic variance was associated with only a 1.2% decrease in the average hippocampal volume per risk allele. So really, it's a, it's a very small effect, and just like we're seeing for many other traits, um, genome wide association effects are small uh, on structure traits. Okay, so we found in the first study, but uh, we weren't actually the only consortium doing this. There were several other, there's actually one other consortium called the CHARGE Consortium that did a very similar study, and we all published together, um, and importantly, a lot of the, uh, all of the variants actually replicated across the different consortia. So uh, there were two variants, two significant loci that were found for hippocampal volume, and there were three significant loci found for intracranial volume. Um, very, all very highly consistent across the different consortia. Okay, success that we had from the initial Enigma consortium, the Enigma 1 project, we sought to expand this both in terms of the phenotype study in terms of the number of subjects that are contributing to the analysis. 
It's expanded in Enigma 2 to around 30,000 subjects in discovery and replication with 50 contributing cohorts, and now focusing on eight total phenotypes, uh, seven subcortical structures, and also intracranial volume. In this type of analysis, we've identified five novel genetic variants um, and replicated our previous hippocampal and intracranial volume results. So here you see those loci that we identified previously on chromosome 12. Um, uh, this is the one that I showed you previously, and this one was also identified by the CHARGE consortium. And interestingly, we picked up uh, some very interesting findings uh, for the PTMN that are very strongly significant. Um, and uh, those are uh, completely novel variants that were identified through this study. The thing is that um, even putamen and thalamus both have pretty equal reliability in terms of segmentation. Um, putamen has many significant hits, whereas thalamus doesn't. This indicates that uh, there's genetic variants have specific effects on different brain structures and most likely on different cell types. At home a little bit more. So here's here you see uh, these spider plots. So each of these indicates um, a particular SNP and the association of this SNP to each of the different uh, different structures. So you can see that this SNP, which was, which was a found to affect putamen, has a strong effect on putamen as expected. However, it does not have a strong effect on pretty many other structures. Similarly, if we look at one, for example, over here. Um, we find that this particular SNP has a strong effect on hippocampal volume, but almost no effect on any other st structure. So the associations uh, have, have are surprisingly specific, and I think they imply complexity when interpreting disease variants. Because, of course, if a genetic variant affects uh, brain, it doesn't affect gr gross brain. It affects a particular structure likely. So it's important that uh, we study uh, many different structures so we can find these genetic variants affecting different structures. Okay, so into the biology that we've uh, that we're trying to learn from these type of variants. So there was one particular variant that I said before was strongly associated with putamen volume. Most of these variants are all, almost always found in intergenic regions with no known gene to be associated. So what we we'll do is see if the alleles at this particular SNP vary with the expression of uh, any of these genes in surrounding. So here we have, for example, the genotype at this uh, associated locus and the expression of the KTN1 gene. And we, as, as we get more C alleles, we get an increased expression of KTN1, this, uh, this gene that's close by. Um, this is importantly done in brain tissue and allows us to link this genetic variant to a potential gene of action. Importantly, we replicated this in another sample of brain tissue um, in both the frontal cortex and putamen. So uh, variant two, so this is uh, 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 KTN codes a protein called connectin. Connectin is found in dendrites and soma of neurons, but not in the axon. It's a receptor that allows vesicle binding to kinesin, so it acts as a molecular motor. Um, and interestingly, KTN1 knockdown induces a 1.5 times smaller cell size. So here you can see a control and then a KTN1 knockdown. You can see the cells are smaller. This might indicate a potential mechanism by which we see a smaller uh, putamen volume uh, when, when there's decreased KTN1 expression. Uh, this is done in HeLa cells, so of course needs to be done in neurons, specifically neurons of the putamen, um, but uh, it does imply that this may be why we're seeing the effects we are. Okay, so Enigma Consortium is again expanding. So now we have more subjects, um, and we're able to look at um, different phenotypes and also expand the phenotypes that we previously looked at. So here's an example of the newest analysis. Um, we can see we're getting more and more genetic variants associated with brain structure. Um, these are in rare genes involved in neural, neural growth pathways, and the, including PI3K and AKT. Um, even a locus near FOXO3, which is known to be involved in brain size. Okay, it's the Enigma Consortium, and very brief. Um, now I'm going to talk to you, go back to this endophenotype concept and evaluate brain structure as an endophenotype for schizophrenia. Importantly, all the methods that I'm going to talk about here can be applied to evaluating brain structure for any trait, uh, any other trait which has GWAS. So, uh, for example, addiction traits can be evaluated on this as well.
Um, there's, so what we want to do is to assess the genetic overlap between subcortical brain structure and schizophrenia. We can do multiple levels. We can do this at, at a global level to assess global overlap. Um, so Genome-wide, is there overlap between genetic variants creating risk for brain structure and those creating risk for psychiatric illness? We can do this so at a local level, so at individual SNP, is there evidence for a genetic variant risk for both brain, stru brain structure changes and risk for psychiatric illness? And we can evaluate the, the y-axis on this plot here, the effect size. So we uh, do genetic variants affecting brain structure actually have higher effect sizes than those affecting risk for disease. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is this global overlap. So global overlap uh, can be evaluated in three ways. We tried three different methods. I'm going to hear the first one, overlap between two ranked lists. So two sets of data, right? I have the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium data for schizophrenia risk, and I have the Enigma data for um, brain structure changes. So what I can do is first rank this list. So, uh, genetic variants creating uh, strong risk for psychiatric illness can be grouped here. Uh, genetic variants creating uh, uh, protective effects for psychiatric illness can be um, grouped on one side. And then where there's no difference, you can those would be in the middle. So we're sort of ranking the data. Again, for the Enigma data, you can set, find genetic variants creating uh, increased brain volume and rank them on one side. And genetic variants with the effect of the decreasing brain volume, I can rank them on another side. And the no difference would be in the center. So then what I can do is I can threshold the data at some kind of significant value, and I can take all the significant SNPs. And so those that are significantly associated with creating risk for schizophrenia, those that are significantly associated with creating risk for brain structure changes, and I overlap them. And I can say if genetic variants uh, creating risk for schizophrenia and brain structure changes overlap significantly as measured through a hypergeometric p-value, then I can say that there is some evidence that, uh, that there's some genetic overlap here, that uh, genetic variants creating, creating changes in brain structure also create changes in risk for psychiatric illness. So um, this is one way to do it, where I sort of threshold, and then I create these diagrams and make an overlapping list. But there are negatives to this test, which is that it's necessary to select a threshold, and the threshold is highly dependent on the n. So the significance thresholds are highly dependent on the n for the two studies, and the n for the two studies is highly different. Um, so an alternative method is called a rank-rank hypergeometric overlap. And what I do is I take the list before, and I sort of turn it on its side. And uh, I take the list for schizophrenia SNPs, I turn it on its side. I take the list for uh, brain structure SNPs. And I can evaluate, I can say, at multiple different step sizes. So let's take the first, the most associated uh, schizophrenia SNPs and the most associated brain structure SNPs. I create the overlap as I would before, and I create, uh, I assess what the p-value would be for this test. I uh, take a different step size, find the genetic variants most associated with schizophrenia, um, do for the brain structure SNPs, and get a p-value, and I can plot that p-value. So with enough times, I can get a map, and maps look like this. So, and I'll show you different cases of what these maps look like. So if you take the same list, if there's perfect correlation between genetic variants creating schizophrenia and genetic, genetic variants creating changes in brain structure, you have a map that looks like this. So first you see very strongly significant negative log 10 p-values, and you see uh, basically a diagonal line here uh, showing the overlap. If the overlap only at the high ends, so at the significant SNPs, then you would see these sort of arrow type of diagrams. Uh, lists are perfectly or anti-correlated, you would see uh, sort of an opposite diagram. Now we uh, try to assess this question. So do genetic variants that affect the structure of the human brain also at risk for schizophrenia? So the thing we did was we wanted a negative control. So we do not think that genetics which affect thumb whirl volume, thumb whirl, uh, whether or not you have a thumb whirl, uh, also create uh, changes in the hippocampus. So these are presumed, presumably unrelated traits. So we would expect the overlap to be low. And you can see here the negative log 10 p-values are low. So uh, as we expect, the, the negative control shows no overlap. 
So a positive control, so uh, putamen and caudate should presumably have high overlap, so there should be high overlap between uh, genetics creating changes in putamen and genetics creating changes in caudate, so you, you can see that there is indeed high overlap. And then evaluated whether genetic variants creating differences in intracranial volume uh, overlap with genetic variants creating differences in schizophrenia risk. And you can see that this looks much more like the negative control than it does the positive control. So the the axis here demonstrates uh, very little overlap. I form this on each of the eight phenotypes, and basically all of the maps look like this. So there is basically uh, no global overlap between the two. So that's the first method for evaluating global overlap between uh, subcortical brain structure and schizophrenia. The next method that we're going to use is called polygenic risk score. In a risk score, you have uh, two samples. You have your training sample, and you have an independent testing sample or a sample with different phenotypes. Okay, in this training sample, we have cases and controls. We then have a genome-wide association study. We get a Manhattan plot, as shown uh, here, in cartoon form. Um, we select a p-value threshold and say, okay, four SNPs above this p-value threshold can create a score based on the regression coefficients for these different uh, genetic variants. Can I score called a polygenic risk score that will tell me the active effect of, uh, of all of these SNPs? Okay, and for this score, I can assess that on an independent sample. Uh, here. And for each individual, I can assess uh, what their polygenic risk score is. I can see if the variance of the phenotype is explained by the polygenic risk score. So on the y-axis, I can do this at different p-value thresholds, as shown here. Uh, the polygenic risk score gives an individual risk score and can be used to determine if the additive effect of multiple risk alleles influence a phenotype. So the two advantages are that it gives an individual risk score and that uh, it allows you to assess the, the additive effect of multiple risk alleles. So you're, again, doing multiple uh, risk alleles, not just one risk allele at a time. We're going to apply this to a true positive data set uh, to see if uh, to see what it looks like when you apply to true positive data set. So, uh, schizophrenia enrichment with other schizophrenia data sets. So the axis here is again the percent variance explained, and each of these different uh, sets of bar plots on the x-axis are different um, training data sets. So the training data set uh, here is uh, much smaller, of course, than the training data data set here, and what we do is to predict if the training uh, uh, polygenic risk score, as predicted by this training data set, predicts a new set of schizophrenia data. Um, so you can see, as, as you get more subjects, the polygenic risk score becomes more accurate, and you can explain more of the variance in a different sample, Would that makes sense. Uh, and then also, you can explain more of the variance. So just look here, uh, the y-axis, you explain about 20% of the variance. Um, from this PGC2 data, uh, predicting on a new independent schizophrenia data set. This uh, method has also been applied to cross-disorder work. So we would try to train on schizophrenia data and then apply to, for example, bipolar data. So if we train on schizophrenia data and apply to bipolar data, you can see we can explain much less of the variance, but still a, a whole lot. So we can explain uh, maybe 2.5% of the variance here, and for major depression, uh, much less, maybe 1% of the variance. Okay, so I've shown a true positive, shown the application to uh, different, uh, different diseases. Now we apply to brain imaging data. So we data set on the schizophrenia data and apply here uh, to the brain data. And here you see hippocampus, intracranial volume, all the different brain structures that we studied through the Enigma Consortium. And uh, it seems that uh, the percent variance explained is extremely low, uh, extremely low as compared to a true positive or cross disorder work. So we're getting about 0.05 percent of the variance here, or maybe even less. So um, our polygenic risk score is showing very similar to the rank rank hypermetric overlap that uh, the score based on schizophrenia risk is generally not predictive of brain structure. One final method is called the LD score um, regression 
genetic correlation. And this method allows you to say, so if SNPs, which have more of the genome, have a higher joint effect on both traits, then there's evidence for genetic correlation. So we see the joint effect on both traits and how much of the genome that that particular variant tags. So if a variant tags a lot of the genome and has a high effect on both traits, uh, and this is in general the uh, the, um, the way the data looks, then uh, the the Neil lab at um, at the Broad have have found that this genetic correlation is proportional to the slope here. So the important thing about this study is that it can this this method is that it can be used without access to raw genotypes or phenotypes. So wait for our data because, uh, like I said previously, we don't have access to the raw genotypes or phenotypes. So here, as applied to multiple different, um, so you can see again that, for example, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia have a high degree of overlap. You can see that height here has a high degree of overlap with infant head circumference, birth length, and birth weight, as you would expect. So the correlations are as you would expect we apply to the branching data. So if there's a genetic correlation between subcortical brain structure and schizophrenia. So here are all the genetic correlations. You can see that the p-values, actually none of them survive significance, so um, none of them are um, significantly associated. Um, how the, the most significant one is uh, hippocampus. It seems that uh, as you um, ink risk factors for uh, for schizophrenia, decrease the volume of the hippocampus. Increased risk factors for schizophrenia decrease the volume of the hippocampus. So, so again, this is showing what the other two methods showed that there's basically a low degree of overlap. Okay, so it's global overlap. Now let's look at local overlap. So, uh, overlap at the specific SNP. In order to do this, we can use what's called a conjunction test. And again, we can have our genome-wide association signal. Um, we can have that from trait one and trait two. And that there's a lot of noise and that uh, most genetic variants are, are not really associated uh, with the traits. Um, there are certain genetic variants which do show some association. And some, like this particular genetic variant, shows association with both traits. So that's what we're interested in, are genetic variants that show association with both traits. And variants like these, um, will basic fallout. So in to do this, uh, we want to find which SNP affects both trait one and trait two, and it's a very simple test where you just take the maximum p-value and then you can regraph. And afterwards, you see that uh, genetic variants here uh, affect both risk for schizophrenia and changes in brain structure. This to each of the individual uh, sets. Um, and try to see if there's any individual genetic variant creating risk for both structure changes and for schizophrenia. Yeah. Um, here's just an example from, with a, which is a conjunction test from the hippocampus. Um, we find no locus, single locus uh, affect both risk for brain structure and risk for schizophrenia across the across the genome, regardless of which of the different eight structures we, that we looked at. Subthreshold loci from the conjunction analysis that were pretty interesting. For example, there is a locus that affects both risk for schizophrenia and putamen volume near the three prime end of the DLG2 gene, and there is uh, also one uh, towards the end of the DCC gene, which is involved in axon guidance, that affects both for conjunction or for putamen uh, structure changes and risk for schizophrenia. Yeah. So these, uh, we don't really want to make too many inferences on because they haven't survived genome-wide significance. However, um, given the genes, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting just to sort of see them. Okay, so the last part is to assess the strength of the endophenotype uh, versus uh, different other traits. So the question is, do genetic variants that affect the structure of the human brain have a stronger effect effect um, on the on brain structure, on the endophenotype, than they do risk for disease. And so the way to do this is, uh, or at least one way to do this, is to graph the effect sizes for the top variants um, associated with different traits. So here are the top variants associated with brain structure, with height, 
with schizophrenia and with educational attainment. Uh, we have them as percent variance explained, so we can put them on the same scale. And we do this separately for discovery and replication cohorts. So discovery cohorts can uh, be, have what's called winner's bias, uh, which inflates the effect size compared to their true effect size. So it's best to compare replication samples to each other. So, uh, the genetic variants associated with brain structure, these are from the Enigma Consortium. You can see that the uh, error bars are much, much bigger than those for height, schizophrenia, or educational attainment. Um, this is because uh, there's, there's less samples in the brain structure uh, analysis than there are for height, schizophrenia, and educational attainment. See, first of all, that they are all of these genetic variants are on the same order of magnitude. So those affecting brain structure, height, and schizophrenia are all on the same order of magnitude. Educational attainment is a little lower, um, but really things around the same order of magnitude. I also see that there are certain variants where it does seem that they could be higher um, than uh, than other. They could be higher than, uh, for example, schizophrenia. But in general, there is no trend to say that um, brain structure traits have uh, a strongly higher uh, percent to explain it, as strongly higher effect size than they do for schizophrenia. Okay, so to our list, so what did we find? So um, we evaluated the global, over, global overlap between subcortical brain structures and schizophrenia, and we found, based on three different methods, uh, a low global overlap. Uh, global overlap, we found none significant. And the strength of the end of phenotype uh, is really on the same order of magnitude as the disease itself. So now we can try to assess uh, the different models that we set out at the beginning to see uh, which models are supported. So um, the supported model now really is that uh, genetic variants which affect brain volume are independent of genetic variants which affect risk for schizophrenia. That means that the endophenotype type of models are all unsupported. So either the mediational model or the uh, liability index model are both unsupported by this current data. can evaluate brain structure as an endophenotype for schizophrenia on the plot before. Um, so optimal endophenotype uh, would be here, but uh, we're finding that subcortical brain structures are have a low effect size and low genetic correlation with the disease, so they are not an optimal uh, endophenotype. So I uh, learned from identifying genetic influences on brain structure. I think it's important to uh, point out that we have uh, definitely, I think, learned some new brain biology. We found new genetic variants affecting the structure of the human brain, and we've also identified some new genes, um, and even some potentially new biological pathways influencing human brain structure. Um, although I showed you uh, that there's little overlap with schizophrenia, this, m these methods can be applied to other data sets, uh, for example, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and we are, for example, finding that the hippocampus um, is highly genetically is is at least significantly genetically correlated with, um, with Alzheimer's disease. So imaging genetics in general can be a way to localize the effects or develop mechanisms of known disease associated genetic variants. Um, finally, there's this third idea that we can use imaging genetics to discover new disease variants. So if genes have a stronger influence on brain structure than disease. Imaging genetics may be better powered to detect effects. How the effect sizes so far uh, indicate that this is unlikely. So um, in my view, the major utility of imaging genetics will not be in finding new disease variants, but finding us where they have an effect. Um, the study that I presented has uh, a considerable number of caveats, um, and I think they're important to go over so that we uh, basically are not too negative about what the results show. So if it's, the results are only applicable to brain structures here studied. So there are, for example, cortical abnormalities found in schizophrenia. Um, it may be that genetic variants creating changes in cortical structure uh, do overlap with genetic variants creating for schizophrenia, and that has not been assessed. Um, we'll assess that once we have the, the data from cortical structures. Um, it's only applicable to the disease here studied, so we uh, can, of course, study multiple different diseases, uh, like Alzheimer's disease, for example, which does seem to have a, a genetic correlation with hippocampal volume. So um, it's important to recognize that just because these do not overlap with schizophrenia does not necessarily mean they do not overlap with any disease. Also, they're only applicable to common variants uh, because rare variants were not studied here. So, um, uh, GWAS chips only tag common variants, so rare variants are not assessed at all. 
uh, sure only gross brain structure, not individual cells. So just because we don't find an effect doesn't it doesn't affect individual cells, that these genetic variants don't affect individual cells. Uh, it is important to know that there can be noise induced by techno technical barriers of combining data across sites, which decrease the genetic overlap. Um, brain structure was also mainly evaluated in adults, so it's possible that overlap exists with other time periods, for example, adolescent time periods or even prenatal time periods, um, if schizophrenia actually exerts its effect earlier. Uh, the sample sizes are different between the two consortia, and especially for the conjunction analysis, this can be um, important. So I, the study does bring up a lot of questions. So one of those questions is, what causes the volumetric differences in patients with schizophrenia? So we know we observe smaller volumes uh, of these different structures in patients with schizophrenia. So what, what causes that? Um, uh, the study doesn't that. It just sort of excludes genetic effects from this. So it would be uh, that they are epiphenomena or environmental influences unrelated to the primary genetic causes. Or it could be rare variation, uh, rare genetic variation that's unmeasured here. Um, in my view, genetic variation must be mediated by altered brain to cause these diseases. So how can we possibly see no overlap? Um, so uh, it's possible that altered brain function in the uh, that we can have altered brain function in the absence of structural changes. I'll, um, I'll talk about that a little bit below. Also, changes um, may not manifest at the gross level. Or, or picking the wrong structure and wrong time period, so uh, we're not just we're just not seeing it. So a, a final question uh, that I have been thinking about is that structure and function are highly related in the brain. So how can a clear functional abnormality like schizophrenia have no basis in gross brain structure? So it's possible that there are deficits we just can't see uh, on the MRI. Like for example, if you have decreased spine density on individual neurons, you probably would never be able to see that on the on the MRI. Um, so um, it is possible that we just need uh, higher resolution methods to, to be able to see this type of genetic overlap. So um, thank you all for, uh, for listening. So I'd, I'd also like to thank uh, people who are really crucial to performing these analyses. So Derek Hybar, Sarah Medlins, Barbara Frankie, and Paul Thompson are all critical parts of the Enigma Consortium. Um, and then this was a big creation with the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, which uh, so Pat Sullivan, Stefan Ripka, and Ben Neal were all very big parts of. Um, and really, this uh, type of analysis would not be possible without people contributing their either their schizophrenia data sets or their imaging data sets to these large consortium frameworks. So really appreciate all of the over 300 co-authors who are contributing data collection or analysis to this type of study. So thank you all very much, um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, thank you, Jason, for a wonderful talk. Um, people can unmute everybody, or you can try to raise your hand at the bottom of the participant list. So I'm, um, uh, let's take questions. So this is what we're at I focus on primary questions. I focus on popular response. So we are there, and we can see so that is a one D. I'm sorry, I can't hear. I'm gonna mute I'm gonna mute everybody. Please tell me raise your hand or say who you are. So who's speaking? Asking the question. No one. Is there a question, or I can ask? I can ask a question. So, Jason, one question I have is, in terms of looking at, say, the connectome, you haven't looked at that, so that could be the aberrant. Uh, connections, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Second question so, I have. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Just, yeah, so I, I want to make it clear that we've only studied some very gross structural phenotypes that were easy to measure. Like the reason that we studied these first was to, as a proof of principle, that we can study structures, can study reliably genetic variants associated with brain structure. 
So it's not necessarily that we've chosen the ones that are specific for schizophrenia or that are likely to be um, the, the critical brain structures associated with schizophrenia. Um, we've presented methods and uh, are able to evaluate this overlap. So, so yeah, so for example, connectomics, you definitely be able to apply the same type of methods to connectomic type of data. Uh, it hasn't been assessed, but again, that is a project that Enigma is working on, which is uh, using diffusion tensor imaging, trying to find genetics associated with different connectivity. So when we have that data, we will be able to use the same methods to assess. So in looking at some of the uh, what's been done on VXDs by uh, Rob Williams in terms of looking at the brain size of ushers and mice, is there any overlap that you see? Yeah, actually, so we did work with Rob Williams on that, actually. And so um, one of the interesting things is he has measured expression of uh, genome-wide expression in different structures across these different BXD strains. And so um, the BXD strains, uh, we looked at, for example, KTN1 expression, um, uh -huh. which is the gene associated with putamen volume in putamen, and saw if it was associated with a larger putamen. And it, it so that it, it helps again along this causal pathway that can one see uh, this variant seems to be influencing KTN1 expression. KTN1 expression seems to be associated with higher volume of the putamen. Um, so so yeah. So this is um, I think it's a it's a really nice sort of cross species uh, way of being able to assess if a gene expression is influenced with the size of a structure. So. And the other question I have is there's, um, I, think, uh, I think also uh, Dan Geshwin is working on this, is that if you look at the uh, surrounding SNPs and so the epigenetic marks, uh, you can explain the increased amount of the variance. This is a fact that uh, Peter Kacheri, Olivia Corden uh, presented for inflammatory, uh, next to inflammatory disease, you can increase the amount of variance. So it, you know, know of anybody who's working on that in the Enigma Consortium? No, so I mean, I, I think that is interesting. So um, so if you, so you're saying basically you subset the genome to functional, theoretically functional elements. So those elements being DNA hypersensitivity or chip seek sites or like this. Um, and then you explain higher percent of the variance so, so you can, you basically subsetted the amount of SNPs that you have until the theoretically functional SNPs. So I think this is interesting, but I think we have to be careful to do this. So when we get the DNA hypersensitivity data, it's usually in gross brain structure, again, where you have multiple different cell types, and you may be sort of rushing out different individual cell type signal. So you, don't, you want to be sure not to throw out particular places in the genome that have washed out DNA hypersensitivity signal that you wouldn't detect unless you had the individual cell types. Make sense. Okay. So, you could, yeah, you could so, make the same argument about inflammatory disease as well, because the you know of cell types in the immune system is quite heterogeneous. Was very interesting that using high you know, 3D analysis basically increases your your the amount of variance that you could detect. Right. Have questions and uh, so there are 40 people here, and I usually go and I call it when it's a smaller group, I call on everybody, but they forever. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I hear someone. 
question earlier that was being was being asked, but we hear it. Could that person repeat the question? Well, uh, if no one has any more questions, I guess uh, thank you, uh, Jason, for a lovely talk. Um, Thanks. This is been recorded. So, on a copy, I can send you. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.